In this episode, we'll take you to the enchanting vistas of Jingpo Mira Lake, where we'll meet one of the local legends of the Dashwelo waterfall. And prepare yourself for the Eastern European culinary delights of Sui Fenghe. All of this happening here on Travelog. Hi, I've just made it all the way up to Heilongjiang province. And yes, Heilongjiang is mostly famous for its ice sculpting festivals and beautiful winters. But we're here right in the middle of summer. And at this time of year, this place has an altogether different kind of beauty to it. From sparkling mirror lakes all the way to underground lava tunnels and so much more. And if you can't make it in person to Heilongjiang, then we invite you right now to this place to join us on Travelog and experience it. I'm Gareth Edwards. Welcome to the Heilongjiang series. That's the Mudenjiang River right here. So let's start off in Mudenjiang. Blessed and cursed, as some people might put it, with one of the coldest climates in Asia, Heilongjiang is located at the northernmost point of China, bordering Russia in the north and Inner Mongolia to the west. Mudenjiang, which means meandering river, is famous for its fertile lands, rice, timber, mineral deposits, and forests. For over a thousand years though, this hidden gem of lush forests, mountains and scenic lakes was known only to a few nomadic tribes. Fast forward a hundred years and Mudenjiang is an altogether different place. Although thankfully its unique natural beauty has remained largely unscathed by modern civilization, it's now considered one of the province's key economic hubs. So how is it that Mudenjiang has been able to retain its fertile land and beautiful scenery? Is it some sort of compensation for the harsh winters? Well, this is certainly a question I'm hoping to answer in the course of visiting three local beauty spots, Jingpo Lake, the Underground Forest, and Suifenghe. Got my ticket for the entrance. We're currently 100 kilometers southwest of Mudenjiang, and just ahead of me is the entrance for Jingpo Lake, which brings in truckloads of Chinese tourists every summer. Let's go in and see why. It takes us round about two hours by bus from Mudenjiang City to reach Jingpo Lake, enticingly referred to by the locals as Sparkling Mirror Lake. It's known for its crystal clear and tranquil waters. This right here is the famous Jingpo Lake, which is about 90 square kilometers in size and 45 kilometers in length. And you can either choose to hike along the shoreline or you can do it the lazy way, which we're going to do, hire a ferry for less than 100 quid. Cool. Jingpo Lake was formed over 5,000 years ago when flowing lava from a volcanic eruption blocked the Mudan River. It is the second largest barrier lake in the world after Lake Geneva in Switzerland. On first impressions, the area has a very relaxed vibe Time seems to slow down around here, and the locals seem quite comfortable with a laissez-faire attitude. So we're currently 350 meters above sea level, and the reflections of the tree-lined shore leave no question as to why this is called Jingpo Hu, which translation is Mirror Lake. The water is tranquil like a mirror. He's a lucky guy to be on this beautiful lake every day. Given that it's off the beaten track, I didn't expect Jingpo Lake to have too many hotels, but people here seem to be really taken to the idea of embracing tourism, and there are hotels aplenty. More than 50 hotels encircle the lake, with prices ranging from cheapest chips for backpackers to modestly expensive. 
So if you're on a budget, or if you're worried about comfortable stay at affordable prices, then you won't be disappointed. And you've got a bit of cash, and you get to stay in a place like this. And if you've really, really got a bit of cash, you can book me a room too. So this is the living room. As you can see, very nice indeed. I mean, it's not dissimilar to something you'd get in the French Alps or chalets in Finland. And as a matter of fact, all the wood was imported from Finland. So you can see the similarities. Very nice. Clearly, this is not somewhere I can afford to stay. Still, why not make full use of the facilities during my quick visit, eh? And that includes the ridiculously over-the-top restrooms. With a multitasking heated toilet, I'm left wondering if it would start polishing my shoes if I whistled. And let's not mention the pretty fantastic view from where I'm standing. Well, we're apparently on our way to a volcano and allegedly there's a famous forest called the Underground Forest. And I don't know about you, but most forests I know are kind of like this, you know, above ground. So I have no idea what to expect, but I'm looking forward to it. Nestled among several volcanic craters in the Zhangguangtai mountain range, you'll find one of nature's wonders, the Underground Forest. Time to go climbing. In actual fact, in 2006, UNESCO even listed the forest in its global geoparks network. So this is the starting point, and apparently it takes a brisk one hour walk to get to the top, so we're going to get going. Also, you can hire a guide here, which we've done. Ni hao. Ni hao. See you at the top. It's estimated that over 5,000 years ago, a volcanic eruption took place here that left behind a dozen craters, and from them, the underground forest grew. The first thing I notice as I make my way around the forest is just how fresh the air is. Most of the trees here are several hundred years old and over 20 meters high. There are plenty of routes you can take, but I suggest that whatever happens, you make sure you head up to the third crater, which is the largest. Ready your cameras and prepare yourself for some epic views. I'm with you, man. I'm actually ashamed to say it, but my cameraman actually beat me to the top. And the reason is, I think it's actually because of this. What a dazzling sight. So this is the scenic region of the underground forest, which is about 20 square kilometers. And there are about seven volcanoes around here. And after 10,000 years, this is what the landscape looks like. Amazing. Well, if it's a sense of excitement that you're looking for, then a trip to the underground forest will definitely stimulate your excitement. And this right here, it's one of the underground lava tunnels. And through there, we head on to the underground forest. See you down there. Okay. Well, as you can see, we're in the volcanic crater 900 meters from the top, and it's freezing cold. It's like a natural refrigerator. So if you come here, make sure you wear a couple of jumpers. And you can see all around us, because of the fertile ground, you've got trees all around and all above us. I'm underground. There's a forest. Underground forest. Well, um, just a small disclaimer. You should probably be aware that the underground forest is not entirely underground after all. So as you can see, on the exit of Jingpo Lake are the famous Diashuelo waterfalls. And apparently it falls around about 4,000 cubic meters of water per second. Quite astonishing. And, and during the rainy season, it tends to swell up in size. This time of the year, it's the biggest it is. And it's quite an amazing sight. And I would say it's just as dazzling as the waterfalls in Aguasul in Mexico, or at least around about the same size. Nice. Gazing at the Dashuelo waterfall, 
it becomes clear why the locals affectionately call it the Niagara Falls of Heilongjiang. As the exit of Jingpo Lake, it's a spectacular sight. It may not be anywhere near as big as its North American counterpart, but what it lacks in size, it more than makes up for in spirit with its roaring waters. Right, so we're about to witness this guy that dives here every day, and he's a bit of a local hero, and some, even during winter, when it's freezing cold, he sometimes dives up to two to three times a day. He's coming right now. <laughs> what amazes me is that Di Huan Ran has been diving here for over 30 years. He even earned himself a place in the Guinness Book of Records as the world's highest waterfall diver. And what initially started out as an enjoyable, albeit slightly risky pastime, eventually became a way of life for him. And now he earns over a thousand RMB a day doing dives in front of millions of tourists every year. Look, he's over there. He's just getting ready, wading away across the water. I think he's going to carry on around and then I, I can't believe he's actually going to dive off. Ah! I can't believe he's actually dove in. That's 20 meters high. Blimey. You won't catch me doing that. You won't catch me doing that. There are many tales and local legends about Jingpo Lake. And I have no doubt that the story of diver Di Huan Ran and his enduring passion for the Dashuelo waterfall will live on for many years to come. Ayya, well, if you think Jingpo Lake is all about scenery, you can think again. You water sports aficionados out there will be happy to know that there is a full array of sporting activities to keep you occupied. But without doubt, the highlight is the international dragon boat race. Seeing as we're on the border with Russia, it'd be a real shame not to have a bit of sporting competitive spirit. And here, during August, on Jingpo Lake, you can witness the dragon boat race. China versus Russia. Go China! And Russia. The international dragon boat race has only been running for two years, but don't think that means it's not already an established fixture. Thousands of people turn up to watch the race. And one thing's for sure, Lots of money has been spent on ensuring a world-class quality sporting event. The media is out in force with hundreds of TV reporters and journalists covering the race. The locals are keen to attract as many tourists as possible. And why not? With big crowds and the teams ready to battle it out, there's a real energy in the air. And this is not only a fun spectacle to watch, but also a great example of cultural exchange. The locals revel in the opportunity to mingle with their Eastern European neighbours in a spirit of competitive camaraderie. After the day's frenzied event, the sun finally sets on Jingpo Lake and the water returns to its tranquil, mirror-like state. As Heilongjiang is mostly far removed from the coast, 
Eating fish has for centuries been somewhat of a rarity. However, Jingpo Lake is a great source of food for people in and around Mudenjiang. It provides more than 40 different kinds of fish, including silver carp, red tail fish, and rainbow trout. What really surprises me is not so much the variety of the fish, but the size of the dishes, which seem to be twice as big as anything you might get in other parts of China. No joke. In Dongbei, which means the northeast, this is what the local hospitality and cuisine is all about. Wow, what a feast! Thank you. This is for the people of the This is for the people of This is the pangtao. This is the jiyu. This is the gen. This is the liyu. This is the jinjun. This is the bai lian. This is the bai yu. This is the jinjun. 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 This is the 这个头可以吃吗? 可以吃,连刺都可以吃 You kidding me? 对 Well apparently you can eat the head and all the bones So uh, sounds like a pretty efficient fish to me to eat Let's give it a go Mmm Yeah, salty, fried <laughs> I'll tell you what I'm going to eat all of it right now Well in extremely harsh and cold climates, people tend to develop a strong drinking culture. There's Russia, for example, and China's northeast is no exception. The hospitality around here will likely involve you drinking copious amounts of alcohol and eating like a whale. You've been warned. <laughs> Whew, I am completely stuffed. I'm going to say I knew that I was going to have to eat a lot of fish if I came to the northeast, but I've never in my life had so many different kinds of fish in one sitting. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven that I can see of, most of which are larger than my arm, and I think I've eaten enough fish to last me, well, at least for the next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank So we're on our way to Suifeng He, but we just had to stop here because I've heard that the rice in Ning'an is very special. And that's not just because of the climatic conditions, but it's also because of the lava with soil mixed together after thousands of years has made this land very fertile. And back during the Tang Dynasty, only the royal family could get their hands on this stuff. Give us some. Uh, I'm joking, we better hit the road. It's not just the rice in Ning'an County that's famous, but also the rice in Heilongjiang as a whole. Every year, 10 million tons of rice is produced here. So as we continue our bus ride to Suifanghe, my thoughts turn back to the question I posed at the start of the episode. What is the big secret behind Mudenjiang retaining its fertile land, lush forests and scenic lakes? Well, the answer seems to reside in the volcanoes. Over 5,000 years ago, volcanic eruptions blocked the Mudan River, which created lakes like Jinpo Lake. And it was the rich minerals contained in the magma that helped create some of the most fertile land in China. If you're looking to catch a glimpse of these beautiful surroundings on your way to Suifanghe, then a bus ride will be right up your street. And it only takes four hours to get there from Jingpo Lake. One of the first things you'll notice when you arrive in Suifanghe is just how international it is. The streets are filled with Eastern European style buildings and everywhere you look, you'll find people of all races wandering around. Well, I'm walking down the main street of Suifanghe and I'm totally confused right now. The street signs are in Russian, the buildings look Russian, I've had Chinese looking people come up to me and speak in Russian as well, but I can guarantee we still are in China. Russian again, of course. 
walking around Suifengha, it's hard not to be aware of the entrepreneurial energy that permeates the city. Russians flock here for business, sightseeing and shopping. And on average, Suifengha receives over 5,000 Russian shoppers a day, intent on buying cheap goods to take back across the border. Unsurprisingly, the locals are more than happy for the business. And one of the things you'll notice is that most of the shopkeepers can speak Russian. Well, I guess that should come as no surprise given the number of Russians crossing the border gates every week. Well, we're at the border gate with Russia, and like most borderland outposts, Suifengho enjoys a good daily influx of trade and tourism. And in fact, during the 90s, the influx got so big that the original gate, which is right there, was simply not efficient enough, and they had to build a new one right next to it, over there. Let's go and see what it looks like. Suifengho first opened its doors to business with the former Soviet Union in 1987, since when it has become Mudenjang's vanguard in Sino-Russian trade. Its free trade zone, along with relaxed visa policies, ensures a robust and profitable relationship with its Russian neighbor. So if you're Russian, it only takes about 30 minutes to sort out a visa here. And if you're Chinese, only around about two hours. But if you're a foreigner, unless you've got one of these, which is a Chinese ID card, which is pretty much impossible, well, you have to go all the way back to Beijing to sort that out. Given that Russia is only a stone's throw away, I thought it would be interesting to check out the Russian cuisine in Suifengha. So I head over to the most popular restaurant in town, Maxim's. Now Russia is famous for its wholesome and hearty food that warms your cockles during the cold winter months. And you can certainly do with some of that in Suifengha, especially when the temperatures start creeping downwards. Here at Maxim's, you take a culinary journey over the border right into Russia. Oh, super, super. <laughs> well, you don't have to go all the way to Russia to enjoy a good Russian meal. In Suifengho, you've got a lot of restaurants like this where you can enjoy good traditional Russian cuisine. And Maxim's, this place, is probably the most famous one of them all. And look around, it's only five o'clock, and this place is absolutely packed. We better get our orders in before the food runs out. Hey. Much like eating in France, for example, the Russian meal is not simply about food. It's an event and a celebration. Even an informal meal can become a festivity with a string of dishes punctuated with toasts, stories and laughter. Russian hospitality is a long-standing tradition and a source of pride for the host. So be prepared to have your fill of bread, salads, meats and above all, soup. Oh yes, the Russians love their soup. So get ready to love it too. Mm. I've got to say, I've had a lot of Russian food before in Beijing. But for some reason, the food here in the borderland next to Russia, it just tastes slightly more pronounced. And it, the taste itself is more, how should I say, it makes you want more. It's moreish, in other words. And it also, it's more salty. It's quite a hearty feel after the meal. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that it's real Russian food. Well, after a hard day's work, there's nothing quite like a Russian meal to sort you out. But the night is still young, and this is the important part, the nightlife. Given its small size, I didn't expect Suifengha to have such economic and cultural vitality. In many respects, its economic rise is typical of borderland cities neighboring Russia and reflects Heilongjiang province's ascendancy. What initially started out as a Sino-Russian trade experiment also gave birth to a booming tourist industry. Especially at weekends, you will find many Russians coming here to visit family, shop, or simply enjoy Suifengha's great nightlife. And in many ways, crossing the border has become somewhat of a lifestyle affair. Well, it's been an action-packed episode. 
and we managed to make it to Jingport Scenic Lake. And on top of that, we witnessed the Dragon Boat Race between China and Russia. And Swayzone Park, well, what can I say? None of the guidebooks said very much about this place, but the mix of Chinese and Russians in a prosperous city like this makes it a very lively place to live. This place officially rocks in my books. I'm Gareth Edwards, I hope you've enjoyed the show, and I'll catch you next time on another episode of Travel Log. Gambi, Tanada. Time seems to slow down around here, and the locals seem quite comfortable with a laissez-faire attitude. So we're currently 350 meters above sea level, and the reflections of the tree-lined shore leave no question as to why this is called Jing Po Hu, which translation is Mirror Lake. The water is tranquil, like a mirror. Lakes was known only to a few nomadic tribes. Fast forward a hundred years, and Mudenjiang is an altogether different place. Although thankfully its unique natural beauty has remained largely unscathed by modern civilization, it's now considered one of the province's key economic hubs. So how is it that Mudenjiang has been able to retain its fertile land and beautiful scenery? Is it some sort of compensation for the harsh winters? Well, this is certainly a question I'm hoping to answer in the course of visiting three local beauty spots, Jingpo Lake, the Underground Forest and Suifenghe. Got my ticket for the entrance. We're currently 100 kilometers southwest of Mudenjiang, and just ahead of me is the entrance for Jinpo Lake, which brings in truckloads of Chinese tourists every summer. Let's go in and see why. In this episode, we'll take you to the enchanting vistas of Jingpo Mirror Lake, where we'll meet one of the local legends of the Dashwelo waterfall. And prepare yourself for the Eastern European culinary delights of Suifenghe. All of this happening here on Travelog. Hi, I've just made it all the way up to Heilongjiang province. And yes, Heilongjiang is mostly famous for its ice sculpting festivals and beautiful winters. But we're here right in the middle of summer. And at this time of year, this place has an altogether different kind of beauty to it. From sparkling mirror lakes all the way to underground lava tunnels and so much more. And if you can't make it in person to Heilongjiang, then we invite you right now to this place to join us on Travelog and experience it. I'm Gareth Edwards. Welcome to the Heilongjiang series. That's the Mudenjiang River right here. So let's start off in Mudenjiang. Blessed and cursed, as some people might put it, with one of the coldest climates in Asia, Heilongjiang is located at the northernmost point of China, bordering Russia in the north and Inner Mongolia to the west. Mudenjiang, which means meandering river, is famous for its fertile lands, rice, timber, mineral deposits and forests. For over a thousand years though, this hidden gem of lush forests, mountains and scenic It takes us round about two hours by bus from Mudenjiang city to reach Jingpo Lake, enticingly referred to by the locals as Sparkling Mirror Lake. It's known for its crystal clear and tranquil waters. 
This right here is the famous Jinko Lake, which is about 90 square kilometers in size and 45 kilometers in length. And you can either choose to hike along the shoreline or you can do it the lazy way, which we're going to do, hire a ferry for less than 100 quid. Jinko Lake was formed over 5,000 years ago when flowing lava from a volcanic eruption blocked the Mudan River. It is the second largest barrier lake in the world after Lake Geneva in Switzerland. On first impressions, the area has a very relaxed 